I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Mark, second half of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament, second half of the Bible, and you'll find it on page 841 in the church Bibles in the Pew Racks, Mark chapter 6, and this morning we're just looking at verse 31. Let's pray as we come now to God's Word. Father God, we do ask that as we bow in Your presence, Your Spirit would teach us from Your Word. And Lord, that Your honor and glory will be elevated. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, friends, Mark chapter 6, and I'll read for us from verse 31. Let's hear God's Word. And He, that is Jesus, said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. Science fiction and science fiction movies are probably not to everyone's taste, I suppose, but if you like any of them, I think you'd like the 2010 movie Inception. The review site Rotten Tomatoes gives it an 87% rating with a critical consensus that it is smart, innovative, and thrilling. It uh, debuted as number one on its opening weekend, and it made in all $823 million worldwide. It was a pretty big success. But this success is something of a surprise as the movie was about the rather obscure matter of the inner workings of the human brain, not normally your typical blockbuster plot. Essentially, spoiler alert, the theme is that in the future, corporate espionage can extract information from CEO types and do that by invading their subconscious brains. By the way, as I was thinking about this week, I did some extra research around the, this issue, and current neurological science estimates that something like over 99% of our brain's thinking is subconscious, which is a figure that is somewhat amusing in its unlikely precision, but at least indicates that our unconscious is important. Anyway, in the movie, an espionage team is tasked not to extract information, but to implant information or to perform an inception, something that had never been done before and was wrought with risk and danger. And by the end of the film, the protagonist, the hero, is unclear whether he is awake or asleep as he finally emerges from the different layers of subconscious of the target's brain. Or does he emerge? Now, the theme today of rest, at one level, seems quite humdrum. Stop working. Take a break. Duh, I get it. Plus, the associated topic of sleep is not one normally recommended for a sermon. Preachers, at the very least, are trying to keep us awake. That said, so-called work-life balance has become a major topic these days, and burnout, a subject that has been much discussed recently. 
And therefore, actually, rest is a game changer if we get it right. It can be smart, innovative, and thrilling because it is a right response to the way that our Creator has made our brains and our bodies, even at the subconscious level. It's important as we get into this that we make sure we understand the context of Mark's gospel. We're just diving into one verse in this, this entire book. Mark's gospel is essentially about the identity of Jesus, who Jesus is, and then a call to us to respond to that identity with mission. And he indicates that's his aim right at the beginning when in chapter 1, verse 1, he says that Jesus, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and he's going to show us that that is who Jesus is. And in chapter 8, he uh, shows us that Jesus is revealed to be who he is at the cross, and indeed at the end of the uh, the gospel, chapter 15, the first time any human in the whole gospel declares rightly that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, is at the cross. And amazingly, that's a non-religious by Judeo, uh, Judaistic terms, a pagan Roman soldier who declares that. That is a warm invitation, therefore, to anyone who is not familiar with religious things, that sometimes the outsider sees things that those who are inside are slower to grasp. And Mark's gospel in the section we're in, chapter 6, has a particular sub-theme to that which is about who gets it and who doesn't. Who gets who Jesus really is and who does not get who Jesus really is. Mark has an interwoven style and he interweaves one theme and another theme together like a piece of rope with different strands. And here you have the apostles who have been sent out. And then John the Baptist, who's killed by Herod, who's, I suppose, the ultimate sign and exemplar of a man who's restless. And then the apostles come back to Jesus and are told, given a different word, not now sent out, but instead Jesus tells them, to rest, because not only the sending of Jesus indicates who He is, but also His calling of us to rest also indicates who He is as the, as the Creator God. So we'll look at this, we'll explore it together in six, in six ways. First of all, six brief ways. First of all, rest because Jesus says so, and He said. He, he sent the apostles out, that was a declared authority of Jesus to send them out, chapter 6, verse 7. Now there's a different kind of instruction from Jesus. He, he tells them now to rest. It's, it's what He says. He tells us to do it. Here we can see the kindness of Jesus. John the Baptist had been killed and the disciples reported his death to Jesus and so some of them presumably would have been frightened by this and in any case the issue that they're facing is not that they've just had lots of work and so tired, the issue they're facing is because of this massive moment when John the Baptist had been killed, not only are they tired, they're stressed. And they're stressed not only at work, but also at home. They, they, there's so much coming and going, they had no leisure even to eat. They, they cannot get away from it. They cannot escape from it. And so Jesus tells them to rest. Listen, my friends, we cannot always be working. An illustration for this, if you ever hunt with a recurve bow, is I'm told that every two to three weeks or so, if you want that recurve bow to have maximum power, you need to unstring the bow. Sometimes we need to unstring and relax. Similarly with a violin and a violin bow, every time after you play the violin, you need to loosen it so that it, it prolongs its life. You don't want to loosen it too much because there's a balance to all this. I uh, think of the story of the lumberjack in Canada. Some of you may know I spent a year working in construction in Canada. Construction is a little too grand a word for it. I was really, really bad at it, but I worked out there and I got to know some of the culture up there in Canada. And it reminds me of the story of the lumberjack, the woodsman, who was once asked, if you only had five minutes to cut down a tree, what would you do? And the answer he gave was, I'd spend three minutes sharpening the axe. 
You've got to take time off in order to be at your best. And this has been demonstratively proved in, 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 in history. The Soviet Union under Stalin attempted to change this pattern of rest in 1929, introduced something they called the continuous working week in order to increase productivity. And it gloriously failed and had to be stopped in 1940. Rest because Jesus says so first. Second, rest. Yes, even you. Even you. Come away. The way it's put here is Jesus is emphasizing you yourselves. Even you. One scholar explains it like this. The original here is unusually emphatic and places emphasis on the need of the disciples themselves. They have been serving others, now they themselves need to be cared for. Yes, even you. Even you. Rest. I've always liked how the King James Version puts it here. It says, come apart. And the old preacher joke used to be that we need to come apart unless we fall apart. Rest, yes, even, even you. Leaders need to rest. Christians need to rest. Mothers need to rest. Fathers need to rest. Children need to rest. Listen, I'm by no means an expert in this area. I'm very much a learner, and I'm continuing to learn as I go through life the importance of rest. When uh, Rochelle and I first got married, I decided I was going to have to bring some changes to my pattern of, of life and my schedule. As a bachelor, I got married when I was 28. As a bachelor in my 20s, I got used to a, a working schedule, schedule of starting at 6 a.m. in the morning and keeping on going till midnight. I took a day off. I, I, I followed that pattern, but I worked from 6 in the morning till midnight, pretty much. And it was, I got a lot of things done. And I thought to myself, as after I got married, I needed to change that a little bit. And so I announced to my wife that I was going to change my working pattern. I was no longer going to work from 6 in the morning till midnight. I was now going to work from 6 in the morning till 11 p.m. <laughs> and I literally said that. And I, I was, I'm a learner. I'm still learning. I remember when Rochelle and I went on our honeymoon, a story we shared with our children over the years. We went on our honeymoon to Jamaica, and when we were there in Jamaica, we, we thought we wanted to make sure we covered as much of Jamaica as we could, and we'd probably never go back again, so we enjoy it while we, while we were there. We were there in off-season, so it was basically us and, and Jamaicans, and we had a great time. And we would move, I uh, think, a little more quickly through things than perhaps the Jamaican culture was used to. And I still remember quite frequently as I was walking down those streets in Jamaica, I'd hear a voice behind me say, Hey, white boy, slow down, man. <laughs> and in my head I thought, I'm on honeymoon. This is as slow as I'm ever going to get. <laughs> but I'm still learning. And I invite us to learn together. I, I did a, there was a, a paper, 2021 article on biology, on the biology of burnout. We're talking about the inner workings of our mind and body. And burnout is associated with sustained activation of the autonomic nervous system and dysfunction of sympathetic and adrenal medullary axis with alterations in cortisol levels. That's a long technical sentence, but basically what it means is burnout changes your hormones. It goes on, the brain changes, systemic, systemic inflammation, cardiovascular disease, and wait for it, premature death. But it also says, and I think this is really significant as I did some research on it for, for you, that it's important to distinguish between clinical burnout and just elongated stress. With elongated stress, if you, if you go online and you Google burnout, you'll find a lot of people talking about it, and probably what they're really describing is elongated stress, which is not the same as clinical burnout. 
with uh, elongated stress, there's a much easier route to recovery. And indeed, the paper says, quote, a human being is capable of enduring considerable amounts of stress if stressful periods are alternated by periods of rest. Who knew? God was right. And it predicts, uh, where, where will burnout come from? It predicts there are f- when there are fewer opportunities to recover from stress, when there are problems both at home and at work, which is exactly what they were facing here. Uh, they had no leisure even to eat. Third, rest with the team. Yourselves. The apostles, your colleagues, your co-workers, your friends, your family. Not, not anybody with them on their own. Of course, this is the purpose of retreats, to get together. Those you work together with, you play together with, you rest together with. Those you do life together with, you rest together with. One scholar put it like this, there is a persistent habit of Jesus taking the disciples away by themselves for relief and instruction. For instance, chapter 4, verse 34 of Mark's gospel, privately or by themselves, same word as here, he explained everything. On their own, he explained everything. He got them together and for relief and instruction, privately explained everything. Chapter 9, verse 2, he took Peter and John up a mountain by themselves, just Peter and John and Jesus for rest and instruction. Or verse 28 of chapter 9, when he'd entered the house, the disciples asked him privately, just by themselves. Or chapter 13, verse 3, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, on on their own, just by themselves. Or chapter 4, verse 10, when he was alone uh, with those around him at the twelve, The twelve asked him about the parables, just them together. And Jesus, fully God and fully man, models the pattern that we're to follow in his own life. Chapter 6, verse 46, after he had taken leave of them, he went up the mountain to pray. Even Jesus, even Jesus, even Jesus. Fourth, rest in a quiet location. Translated here, a desolate place. Some translations have it as a desert. But the point here is not that it was a particularly unpleasant or arid area of the country. We know that from verse 39, the same place is where there was green grass. So it's not literally a desert or a desolate place. The point is that it's uninhabited, it's quiet. This is key for rest. This is key for sleep, of course, that they'll be quiet. A rhythm of shutting down. Uh, Maybe just get the TV out of your bedroom. Certainly turn it off. Turn off the screen, your cell phone, turn it off. Uh, Technically, exactly why we need sleep is physiologically complicated, but we know we need it. Sleep, a paper from Oxford University, Department of Physiology, talks about all the reviews, all the different sleep deprivation studies that have been done and shows that it, that, that it has an impact on us, even though it's not sure exactly why it has an impact. It is, though, it says, well known, however, that deep sleep is a major modulator of hormonal levels, metabolic status, and the immune system. It affects our kidneys, our liver, our heart because of the circadian rhythm. We're used to shutting down, being dark, and then day, and there's a rhythm in our body. We might not know exactly why we need it, but we know that we need it. It's a complicated process, sleep itself, but we know we need it, and we need quiet to have it. Fifth, rest, but only temporarily, for a while. The word there for a while means few or little or scanty or small. 
That is, it's rest for a reason. The reason is for renewal. What we're talking about here is not simply a little bit of R&R, &R, rest and relaxation. What we're talking about here is rest for renewal. That is R for R. It's a purpose behind it, and it's only temporary. And indeed, as we see here, it can be interrupted for the, the, the progress of the gospel as their, their rest is interrupted for the feeding of the 5,000. The great uh, expositor Matthew Henry put it like this, quote, He calls them only to rest a while. They must not expect to rest long, only to get breath, and then to go to work again. There is no remaining rest for the people of God till they come to heaven. And it's a balance here, isn't it? Because while there are those who, as we're thinking, need rest, sometimes rest can be an excuse for laziness. And rest for no gospel purpose well, that can be just a way for us to take life easy. Twenty-hour working weeks, a weekend starting at 10 a.m. on Friday, it's drift. Well, we have a task to do, but we need to rest in order that we can perform that task. Rest, but only temporarily. Six, rest from pointless hurry. There are many who were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. It was important to observe this because the reason why they needed to rest was not that there was so much work, but that there was so much hurry. Their work had become disordered, coming and going, couldn't even find time to eat. If we're to really experience a life that is well rested, we need order in our lives. It means having order in our houses. What's the old sailing phrase? For those who navigate on boats, there's a place for everything, and everything has a place. But if our home life is, and our houses are a complete chaotic mess, we're, never going to, we're, not going, we're unlikely to experience rest because there's no water coming and going, no time to eat. Without order, little work will be done with much hurry. This comes down to managing our lives. It includes relationship management. It's fascinating to observe, and I've shared this a few times with our staff team over the years, and something I learned myself from someone else back in England, but it's fascinating to observe how Jesus models relationship management. There are the three that He's particularly close to, Peter, James, and John, and John's Gospel tells us that He's especially close to John, the beloved disciple, in other words, His closest friend are those that he's especially close to. There's the three, then there are the twelve, the core team. Then there's the seventy-two that he sends out and gives instructions to and disciples. And then there are the crowds. And he doesn't relate equally to all those different concentric circles of relationships in the same way. That's impossible. You cannot relate equally intimately to the three as you do to the crowds, but you need the three that you're relating to at an intimate, personal level. But then you have a different kind of relationship to the crowds. It's relationship management, order in our lives, in our relationships. And of course, this includes time management. And I expect many of you are very good with the management of your time. I remember when I was at high school, and we were all, all us teenagers at the time, were feeling a little bit burdened and overwhelmed by the exams that were coming up and thinking, how can we get all the revision done and the preparation done in order to be effective in those exams? And I remember a teacher sitting us down and saying, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you something now that will be useful for those exams, but also useful for the rest of your life. If you are facing a season where you're feeling overwhelmed, what you should do is look at that day and divide that day into 20-minute increments. It's amazing how much you can get done. 
Boy, was he right. That's managing your time. You can't live like that every day. But you can order your day so that there is time to eat. You're not hurrying. And when we do that, then we have space for creativity and intuition, the right brain rather than the, the left kind of structured part of our brain, the, 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 the creative space, the big picture. G.K. Cheston once said, a madman is not someone who's lost his reason, but someone who's lost everything but his reason. And we've always been hurrying. We may be rationalistic, but we, we can't anymore see the big picture. It helps us gain perspective. And we live in a world where we are constantly overloaded with information. Tech is all around us, and whether it's Instagram or Twitter, or as it's now called X, or Facebook, or whatever the social media or the interactive internet app you will be using, popping up alerts all the time on your phone, and, and you're constantly hurrying and being told to hurry, you've got to do this now, and do this now, and do this now. And, and in our tech, always on world, we need to have order to use the off switch. Well, rest. Why? Rest because Jesus says so. Rest, yes, even you. Rest with the team, your family, your friends, your colleagues. Rest in a quiet location, a desolate place that is uninhabited, quiet. Rest, but only temporarily. Rest for a purpose, for renewal. And rest from pointless hurry, which means ordering our lives in a way that we're not overwhelmed and we order our days and our weeks and our relationships. On September the 7th, 2017, a man called Victor Pratt in Coolidge, Arizona, held a birthday party for his child in his backyard. He had a barbecue and he got his his friends together and they were having a grand time and then they noticed there was a rattlesnake in the backyard and uh, Victor Pratt who felt he knew quite a lot of things about snakes he decided to show his guests not only how to catch a rattlesnake but also how to cook one he grabbed the rattlesnake but then he lost grip and was bitten they rushed into hospital in Phoenix 60 miles away and he began a regimen of anti-venom and heavy sedation for a week, and they saved his life. Afterwards, he was interviewed as to what he'd learned from this experience, and 48-year-old Pratt said, here's what I've learned, ain't gonna play with snakes no more. No rest is a snake. Avoid it. Don't try to pick it up and cook it. Ceaseless work will result in work ceasing in the end, or at least creativity and productivity diminishing at the, at the very least. What's the phrase? All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. A classic science fiction story written by C.S. Lewis was called Out of the Silent Planet. And in that classic science fiction story, C.S. Lewis captures the experience of our mechanistic prison of our modern culture where everything is process and like a machine, an industrial machine that we live within. And he compares that with the flow of life from the point of view of an unfallen and more balanced species from another world. Human characters are revealed as being all grab and get, not live and love. Today, of course, is Sunday. It's true, some cannot rest on Sunday in our 24-7 contemporary employment world. 
but if we can, commit to do so. Make church your priority. Don't play at your worship, work at your play and worship your work. My friends, God will only be at the center of our lives if worship is at the center of our calendars. For those of us whose job means we cannot rest on Sundays or at least not regularly, we can nonetheless imitate the pattern of one in seven rest. Not just to goof off and waste time with dubious entertainment, but to stop the restless grind, to restart resting in grace. And remember, what matters far more than mere physical matter, ultimately God. And so renew ourselves, that is our very souls, by resting with Jesus. Let's pray together. We've said that quiet is a factor in rest, so let's have a moment of quiet. Not to get more information. but to receive from the Lord and His Word. Let's be quiet. Oh, Lord God, like so many things, it is a balance. We do live in a world of ceaseless hurry, and we also live in a world of entertainment, fixated laziness. We think of those who've gone behind us, before us, the greatest generation and other who managed to achieve so much. And we wonder whether, Lord, actually you know best all along. A day off each week, time with you in quiet over your word and in prayer. As the great Christian leader from yesterday used to say, I've got so much to do today, I need to at least spend an hour in prayer. Help us, Lord, to learn from the wisdom of the past, of your word, and come and rest a while not to goof off and waste time, but so, Lord, we might be more effective for you, more productive for you, more fruitful for you. Especially, Lord, we think of Sundays. The pattern these days seems so often that people treat Sunday as an optional extra compared to other demands on their lives, sports and vacations and as if, Lord, the worship of You is less important than other priorities. Forgive us. 
help us to see its impact upon our lives and our society. Help us, Lord, to put you back at the heart of our days. And so, Lord, by your Spirit, grant us great fruit, productivity to your glory. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.